going to tell you a little bit about some of the stuff we've been doing in the lab over the last sort of five to ten years now on the function of this protein, NS5A, which some of you will be very familiar with. So for those who are not, I'm going to try and give you a little bit of an introduction to Hep C for those who are not familiar with this virus and indeed those who are not virologists. So what I'll do today is, first of all, give you that introduction to Hep C, the natural history and molecular biology of this virus, and just illustrate some of the tools we have available to, to study this virus. And then I'm going to tell you two stories. One is a bit of an old story, and it's a, but I think it's still a very interesting story because it hasn't really been followed up by any, anyone else yet. And I think this is a, a, maybe a paradigm for, uh, for other viruses that I think we need to look at. And that's regulation of a, a host cell potassium channel by NS5A. And then I'll tell you a more recent st story, which is to do with phosphorylation of this protein and some of our recent insights into how this protein is phosphorylated and what the potential function of that phosphorylation might be. So what do we know about hep C? Well, I'm sure you're all familiar with the fact that this is an important human virus. It infects up to 170 million people throughout the world. We do have very good therapy now for it. Over the last six months, even, uh, there's been some dramatic changes in our ability to treat this virus. And we now have a number of direct-acting antivirals, and H hep C is now beginning to look a bit like HIV in terms of the therapeutic options that we have. So these are highly effective small molecule inhibitors of the polymerase, of the protease, and also of NS5A, interestingly. And uh, these, these are being used now in clinics across the world. However, they're very expensive, so it's been estimated a course of therapy costs about $80,000 at the moment. So you can imagine that's prohibitively expensive for most of the world. And also, we're likely to see resistance. So HCV, and I'm not going to show you the, the image of this, but is probably the most variable virus we've ever known. It's much more variable than HIV. So here we are about to apply selective pressure to this virus. So I think resistance is going to crop up and that will obviously be a problem for, for treating this virus. So I think we do need additional therapeutic options, like HIV, where we have 30 different drugs available. We need to get to that situation with hep C. And for that, I think we need to have a greater understanding of virus biology. And indeed, NS5A being a good target, we don't really know how these inhibitors work against NS5A. So we need to understand this protein in a bit more detail. <clears throat> we need to understand the virus in order to understand how these therapies work and also to develop new, new therapies. So the natural history of the virus is that after inf initial infection, in, in some cases, about 15% of cases, patients just have an acute infection. They clear the virus, immune-mediated clearance, and they remain nice and healthy. This is a healthy liver here. But for most people, the virus establishes a chronic infection. We really don't know what the difference is between these two groups of patients. In half of those people who, be who become chronically infected, actually they're quite healthy. They have normal levels of ALT as a, uh, alanine aminotransferase, which is a liver enzyme released from damaged liver. So if you have normal levels of that in your blood, your liver is pretty healthy. They might have a mild hepatitis. But for the other 50% of people, they have elevated levels of ALT in the blood. They have ultimately cirrhosis, and in many cases, hepatocellular carcinoma, which is a very aggressive tumor and essentially fatal. So a lot of people will suffer long-term liver disease, and this could, could happen maybe 30 or 40 years after initial infection. We really need to understand those mechanisms of pathogenesis and try and, try and stop this. So this is an RNA virus. It has a single-stranded RNA genome of about 9.5 kilobases in length. At each end of that genome are untranslated regions, which are highly structured RNA, RNA elements. The one at the 5' prime end is an internal ribosome entry site, and that allows uh, the CAP-independent initiation of translation. And there's a single polyprotein is translated. And that single polyprotein of 3,000 amino acids in length is then cleaved by host cell and viral proteases into the structural proteins at the N-terminus and the non-structural proteins at the C-terminus. So what do we know about those proteins? Well, we know the core is the capsid. It probably binds to the virus RNA and forms the capsid or the internal structure of the virus genome, of the virus particle. Two envelope glycoproteins which, uh, as their name suggests, are the envelope. They're present on the outside of this, of this membrane-bound virus. A small protein called P7, which is an ion channel. We've sold the structure of P7 in leads, and, uh, and we know that this forms an oligomer in, in membranes within the cell and is involved in moving ions throughout the cell. That's the subject of a different seminar. And then the non-structural proteins are mainly involved in RNA replication. The NS3 is a protease, also has helicase activity. It, it interacts with its cofactor in this 4A. We know the structure of this, of this protein, and this is now a target for antiviral therapy. We also know the structure of the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, which 
which will uh, replicate the genome and again target for very good direct acting antivirals. NS2 and NS4B are, are other proteins that have, we understand some of the functions of some of these proteins, but in many cases we, we really don't understand fully what, what, what these proteins are doing in the virus life cycle. And NS5A I'll come back to in a minute and tell you in a bit more, more detail about NS5A. <coughs> Excuse me. So what systems do we have available to understand virus replication? Well, for most viruses, you can just take virus and you can throw it onto cells and culture and it grows and it, you can understand it biochemically and cell biology. That turned out not to be the case for HCV and it was a long time before we had systems that we were allowed, allowed to use. So the first system that really allowed us to understand virus replication in detail was the subgenomic replicon. And this was developed initially by Volker Lohmann, who I believe gave a seminar here not so long ago. So maybe Volker introduced re replicons to you, but just very briefly to tell you that this is the, the virus genome. And what Volker did was that he deleted the, the sequence coding for core through to NS2 and replaced these with a selectable marker and a second internal ribosome entry site. And if you make an in vitro transcript from this, this construct, you can then put that into cells. And we use these HUH7 cells, which are a human hepatoma cell line. You can make a stable cell line that expresses these five proteins. And these five proteins are necessary and sufficient for RNA replication within the cytoplasm of those cells. And if you stain these cells with an antibody to NS5A, you see this night punctate staining within the cytoplasm. And these are all sites of RNA replication within the cell. You can also modify this putting a luciferase here. So you can, instead of having to select out stable cell lines, you can, you can measure the, the input translation. This RNA is translationally competent, gives you a nice measure of the efficiency of transfection. And if that's replication competent, the, the levels of luciferase will be maintained or even increased. If you make a mutation in the polymerase, which is a polymerase dead mutation, kills polymerase, then the RNA is degraded, you get no translation. So, the difference between the wild type and the, and the GND mutant gives you a measure of RNA replication, an indirect measure as measured by luciferase. So this has been a great system for understanding how this virus works at the molecular level, but it's missing quite a lot. It's missing all of these structural proteins and NS2, so it doesn't make virus particles. And then in 2005, Takaji Wakita, who was in, in Tokyo, identified a, a clone of the virus which actually would replicate fully in, in tissue culture. This came from a virus which he called Japanese fulminant hepatitis. It came from a patient with fulminant hepatitis, very aggressive, rapid onset hepatitis. And the virus that he isolated from, from that patient, called JFH1, and in this case, an in vitro transcript of this in full length genome, transfected into HUH7 cells, produces virus particles. So you can then take those virus particles and reinfect new cells, reinfect chimpanzees when we were allowed to do chimpanzee experiments. And this is a major breakthrough, and this just shows you an image of these cells. Infected with JFH, you can see NS5A again in those punctate staining. And this is the core protein, the, the, the capsid protein, which surrounds lipid droplets within the cell. I think this is quite a beautiful image of those lipid droplets, perfectly surrounded by the core protein. So this really provided the systems by which we can start to understand how this virus replicates in cells. We can understand its, the, the functions of the various proteins. Excuse me. Okay, so let me tell you a little bit about NS5A and what we know about NS5A so far. So this is the structure of this protein. It's a protein of about 450 amino acids in length. It has three well-defined domains, which are separated by low complexity sequences, flexible regions, and I'll come back to these in, in, in the rest of the talk. At the end terminus of this protein is an amphipathic helix, which locks it onto membranes within the cytoplasm, particularly ER membranes. Domain one, we have the crystal structure for. We know that this binds to, to a zinc molecule. So what do we know about NS5A? It's a key component of an RNA replication complex. So with those other proteins expressed in the replicon, it can form a multi-protein complex which replicates the virus genome. But it also has a completely independent role in virus assembly. And we really don't understand that either of these roles, in fact, how it's functioning in both of these two processes that are key within the virus replication cycle. We know it binds virus RNA. We and others have shown that each of these domains individually can bind to the virus RNA. And we know that it binds multiple cellular factors, and the list is growing. I think it's up to about 130 now. So we really have to try and understand what, which of those cellular factors are important for, for, this, for the function of NS5A. So here's the structure of, the, of, this, of this domain one. And there's two, been two crystal structures solved of, of the genotype 1B 
tennis by day. One by Tim Tellinghusen, who was in Charlie Rice's lab at the time, and, and then another structure published a few years later. And essentially, they both show a, a dimer of this domain one. But the dimers are very different in the dimer formation. They same, have the same monomer, but the dimer is, is configured in very different, different ways. I'm just trying to illustrate this with this. Here's a, 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 a hydrophobic patch here, which you can see here. Dimers are twisted around on, on, in, in re relation to each other in terms of the monomers. So that the dimer interface is very different in each of these two dimeric structures. And I'll come back to that a bit later on in the, in the talk and discuss whether these are two forms of 5A that might actually exist in, a, in an infected cell and how you might regulate those, the change between those two forms. Here's the inhibitor of 5A, which is now in clinical trials. It's called declatosphere. And it's also a perfect palindromic inhibitor. It's a very big molecule. And the, the, the implication is that it would bind to the dimer by interacting with the two monomers. There's some evidence for that, but it, it's not great as yet. So we don't know whether this stabilizes the dimer, disrupts the dimer, and which one of those two dimers it might interact with. You can do all sorts of in silico modeling to show that it would bind to either of those or to the monomer. So we'll, the jury's out really as to how this molecule might interact with NS5A. But it's a very effective molecule inhibits it down to picomolar level, so it's an extraordinarily inhibit, in, incredibly uh, inhibitor, inhibitory molecule. Okay, so my lab's been interested in, in a number of protein-protein interactions in, associated with virus infection. And way back, we used to work with HIV, and we worked with a protein called NEF in HIV. And NEF is, is an important protein in the virus life cycle, and it has polyproline motifs that interact with cellular SH3 domains. And it turns out that NS5A also has these polyproline motifs. And these polyproline motifs are inter associated with this region here, long, low complexity sequence two, which is separating these two well-structured structured domains one and two and three. This is the sequence of that polyproline motif, and it has this, this consensus PXXPXR, and this is a classical motif for binding to an SH3 domain. And there are 293 SH3 domains in the human genome they interact with proteins that have this PXXPXR motif. This is absolutely conserved in all HCV isolates. So I've just shown you three isolates here of different genotypes. There are seven different genotypes of the virus. But every one of the thousands and thousands of HCV isolates that are in the database has this sequence here, the conserved prolines and the arginine. And we've shown in our lab in a number of studies that it interacts with SH3 domains. And this was uh, work done several years ago where we should, this is modeling the peptide from an S5A bound into the crystal structure of an SH3 domain. And we've shown interactions with a number of different SH3 domains. So this is really very, very well established that this, this protein interacts with SH3 domains. And it does through, through this P2 motif, which is a class 2 SH3 domain binding motif. So it's all very well and good to say, well, this protein interacts with SH3 domains. We can show it in vitro. We can show it in vivo. But does it play a role in virus replication? And we naively assumed that it would because it was absolutely conserved in this virus. There's a limited gen genetic components of, of this virus, and it absolutely conserved this motif. So we thought it has to play a role in HCV replication. So we set out in a number of experiments to try and test this. And so what we did is we took the infectious clone of the JFH1 genome, which, as you, as I, you remember, I told you a couple of minutes ago, replicates in, in cell culture, produces viruses. And we made mutations. We made a specific mutation in these proline motifs, in the P2 motif, where we mutated those prolines to alanines. We called this the PA2 motif, mo mutation for obvious reasons. And we made this, this specific mutation in the context of the infectious JFH1, made in vitro transcripts, transfected them into HOH7 cells, and then looked for the release of virus particles to ask, is there a, is there a phenotype of this mutation? And the answer was, no, there wasn't. So here's the, the data. Release virus from either the wild type in green or the PA2 mutant in, in red over various time points after transfection of cells with the, the transcript. And you can see that they both release decent amounts of infectious virus, and there's absolutely no phenotype for this proline mo motif here. So this is bitterly disappointing, as you can imagine, because it's absolutely conserved. So why would it not have a role? So we started to think about what other potential roles this, this motif might have. And given that it's not clearly involved directly in virus replication, could it be involved in modulating the host cell in some way? <coughs> so we asked the question, is there any role for this conserved P2 motif? 
So here I need to introduce you to a, a, a different aspect of, of what we were doing, and this is to introduce you to electrophysiology or patch clamping, and I'm sure some of you will be aware of this, but maybe not all. So this is a study of ion channels in cells, where you, you in what I think is an extraordinarily technical, technical achievement, you take a glass pipette, which you, you, you extrude, and you use to make tight contact with a tiny t area or patch of the membrane of, a, of an individual cell. You then apply suction to disrupt that membrane patch there, so that the interior of the cell then becomes continuous with that uh, whatever you have within the pipette. And then you can manipulate currents across this, across this uh, membrane here and measure membrane potential, measure ion, ionic currents that will be carried by channels in the rest of the cell. We call this whole cell recording. So why am I telling you this? Well, what a few years ago, a, a new person joined my lab, a guy called Jamel Mankouri, and he had come from an ion channel lab, and he kept saying to me, Mark, we must have a look in H87 cells and replicon cells and virus-infected cells to see what sort of ion channels might be affected. So eventually I said, okay, Jamel, go away, go away and do this. So what he did was to look in H87 cells, and he looked at a number of currents, but first of all, he looked at potassium currents. And so what you see if you patch these cells and... and just to describe the sort of data we get, as you increase the voltage across the, across the membrane, at a certain point in that voltage, you, you suddenly get a current applied ac across, the, across, across this membrane. And this is indicative of, of channels opening at a particular voltage, these voltage-gated potassium channels. So he saw nice channels in H O H seven cells, but then when he looked in replicon cells, so these held cells which are stably harboring that wild-type replicon, which I introduced to you a few minutes ago, to his surprise he, or, and pleasure, he saw that there was no potassium signal in these wild-type replicon cells. So whatever this potassium channel was, it was completely blocked in the replicon cells. And we also had for these replicon cells a proline mutant, because remember the proline motif is not required for replication, so he could make a proline mutant replicon cell which was stably harboring that, that replicon. And when he looked in these replicons, lo and behold, that channel was restored. So it was something to do with this proline motif was blocking this potassium channel in the cells. Now, you could argue that we just selected out a different population of cells here. So what he did was to cure these cells. He treated them with interferon, which will get rid of the replicon, restore those cells to, 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 uh, to the HOH7s. And when he did that, when he cured these cells with interferon, the channel came back again. So it wasn't the fact that the channel was missing in a particular population of cells. You could restore that by getting rid of the replicon. So what that said was that that potassium current in replicon cells was blocked by NS5A, and it was blocked in a, in a proline motif-dependent fashion, because we made it in mutation, we got the, ch the channel back. So to cut a long story short, and I'm going to cut a few stories short, this potassium current turned out to be encoded for by a single potassium ion channel called KB2.1. This is the structure of this ion channel. It has six transmembrane domains, N and C termini in the cytoplasm. And the way you can test that out is by adding an antibody into the patch pipette. So you add an antibody into here. If that antibody interacts with the channel, it will block the activity. And what he saw is when he added an antibody to KV2.1, you reduce the channel activity, whereas controls didn't. And in, if you Western blot or you immunofluorescence for the KV2.1 channel, you can see it's present in H 7 cells, it's present in H 7s and the replicons. And it's not that you've lost the channel. The channel's still there. It's just not active. So something is happening to the activity of that channel in, in the replicon cells. So we set out to have a look at what that, what that function might be, how, how 5A might be blocking that. And we know that KV2.1, which is well characterized, is, is driven by phosphorylation. So particularly, it gets phosphorylated on, on a single residue within the cytoplasmic tail on serine 800, and it's phosphorylated by MAP kinase. So P38 MAP kinases are activated by, for example, oxidative stress, but a number of other, other stresses as well. And you can do this in vitro by treating with this DTDP oxidate, oxidative stress inducer. And P38 MAP kinase will phosphorylate KB2.1 on serine 800. So luckily, there's an antibody to this specific phosphorylated form of KB2.1. This gets translocated into plasma membrane and inserts into the membrane and then provides that signal that, that pumps potassium out of the cell. And indeed, if you treat with DTDP, you see an increase in this channel. And if you treat with an inhibitor of MAP kinases, 
you reduce that. So it says that this potassium channel is regulated by phosphorylation in HUH7 cells. So we asked whether NS5A blocked that phosphorylation. And like I said, there's, a, there's an antibody to this phosphorylated form of KV2.1. Okay, so let me just take you through this. So what we did was to take HUH7 cells, or cells harboring the wild-type replicon, or the proline mutant replicon, and treat them with this DTDP, which is a, an inducer of oxidative stress. And then Western blot for the phosphorylated form of KB2.1, or total KB2.1 GAP GH for control. And what you can see is that in HOH7 cells, as you treat with DTDP, you increase the phosphorylation of KB2.1, but you don't see that increase in wild-type replicon cells. In the proline mutant replicon cells, that increase is restored. So phosphorylation of this molecule, KB2.1, is blocked in replicon cells. And sure enough, if you look in replicon cells, when you treat DTDP, you don't really see a significant increase in channel activity. So we looked a bit further back in the, in the, in the cascade and asked whether P38 MAP kinase was affected by NS5A. And the bottom line is that yes, it is. So phosphorylation of MAP kinase, you can detect this again with a, with a phosphorus-specific antibody, is inhibited in the wild-type replicon cells, but restored in interferon cured or in the proline mutant replicon cells. And another target of P38, which is MAP cap kinase, is not phosphorylated by, by this in, in the replicon cells. So it looks like NS5A is functioning upstream of KV2.1, probably at the level of, of MAP kinase. So why would this be important? Well, KV2.1 turns out to be a pro-apoptotic channel. So induction, activation of KV2.1 induces apoptosis. So if you induce oxidative stress, P38 will phosphorylate KV2.1, which pumps potassium out of the cell. The reduction in potassium levels within the cell induces caspases, induces apoptosis. So you can imagine that if you induce oxidative stress in the virus-infected cell, that KV2.1 might be driving that apoptosis. So does NS5A block that induction of apoptosis? And the answer, of course, is yes, it does. So if you treat with DTDP and you look for apoptosis, and we've done this in a number of ways, but I'm showing you here the, uh, the nuclear fragmentation. In HOH7 cells, you get very efficient nuclear fragmentation when you induce with DTDP, and you can see that in the, the black lines here. This is three hours after DTDP treatment. You see a massive increase in, in apoptosis. If you look in wild-type replicon cells, you really don't see that induction of apoptosis when you treat with DTDP, so you're going from here to here. It's restored in the interferon cured or the proline mutant replicon. So NS5A is blocking the induction of apoptosis as a result of oxidative stress by inhibiting the activation of, of KB2.1. So that's in replicon cells. Does it happen in, in infected cells? The answer is yes, it does. So here I'm showing you cells either uninfected, infected with wild-type virus, or the proline mutant replicon, proline mutant virus, which, as you know, replicates efficiently. And again, you can see that phosphorylation of KV2.1 is blocked in the JFH1 wild-type cells, but not in the proline mutant cells. We can't do patch clamping on virus-infected cells because we can't take them out of the BSL level 3 lab, but we can do that on on cells which are infected with a virus which lacks E1, E2, just has the core P7, NS2. And again, in those cells, you can see that there is a reduction in KV2.1 activity compared to naive cells. So this happens not only in replicons, but also in virus-infected cells. So more recently, we've gone on to look at this in a little bit more detail. And Clearly, what we've done so far is to look in replicon cells and virus-infected cells. And the implication is that NS5A is important. But is NS5A necessary and sufficient? Well, we've answered that question by transfecting cells with NS5A expression constructs, where NS5A is separated from GFP by an iris. You can transfect cells with those. You can fax sort for the GFP cells and then patch clamp those cells, which you know are just expressing NS5A. And under those circumstances, we can see that, again, there's a reduction in the levels of KV2.1 activity compared to vector cells. So clearly, NS5A is necessary and sufficient for KV2.1 inhibition. You don't need to have the rest of the virus present. So more recently, we've been having a think about what might be the target for NS5A in, in this P38 pathway. So clearly, it's got to be something that has an SH3 domain because the poly motif abolishes this interaction. So <clears throat> we, make, we took use, made use of, of a system which had been established by Chris McCormick in my lab, 
where he introduced into NS5A a tag, a biotin acceptor tag. And, and NS5A is unique and at the C terminus of this protein you can introduce tags, even GFP, quite big tags, and it will stably harbor those that still replicate, still produce this virus, in fact. And this means you can purify NS5A. And so what we did was to purify NS5A with this PSCDD, this biotin tag purified by streptavidin beads, and then use that to screen a phage display library. We did this with Kali Saksela in, in the University of Helsinki, who has a library of all 296 SH3 domains in the human genome in a, in a phage display library. And we identified a number of proteins from this, this screen, but one of these was a protein called mixed lineage kinase 3, or MRK3. And MRK3 turns out to be upstream of P38 map kinase. It's involved in the induction of apoptosis in rat hepatoma cell lines. So we figured that this might be the kinase that was interacting with NS5A that might be involved in this, in this, in this process. So we showed that MLK3 interacts with NS5A, so here's an immunoprecipitation of endogenous MLK3, which we then western blotted with NS5A. And what you can see is that when you immunoprecipitate with an MLK3 antibody, you also pull down NS5A. And if we turn that system around and look the other way around, when we immunoprecipitate NS5A, and this in this case was strep tagged, and western blot for MLK3, again, we're pulling down MLK3. And we see a reduction in that interaction when we have the proline mutant present, but not a complete abrogation. And this was published last year. Is MLK regulate, MLK3 regulation of KV2.1? Does MLK, MLK3 regulate KV2.1? Well, yes, it does. So if we silence MLK3, and you can see this here, we see a reduction in the levels of, of KV2.1 activity compared to silencing GFP. So MLK3 phosphorylation clearly induces that cascade which, in, which activates KV2.1. And if we transfect in an MLK mutant that's kinase dead, that will block the, the stimulation of, of, uh, of KV2.1 activity. And I'll just take you through this. Here's the vector alone. This is the basal level of, of uh, activity of, this, of the KV2.1. If we exogenously transfect in excess MLK3, we stimulate that. If we also transfect in NS5A, it blocks that stimulation. And if we transfect in the kinase dead version of MLK3, it completely inhibits the activity of KV2.1. So what we think is happening is that HCV is replicating, and the RNA, gene, RNA replication complex and the, and the replication of RNA has been shown to induce oxidative stress in infected cells or in replicon cells. We think that oxidative stress is then triggering apoptosis. Now, clearly, that is bad news for the virus. The virus doesn't want to have apoptosis induced because the, the virus-infected cell will die. So a virus has to have a way of blocking the induction of apoptosis. And so NS5A is, is blocking this pathway by blocking MLK3 activation, which is blocking the activation of, of KV2.1. So we think that this is an important mechanism, not the only mechanism, but one mechanism by which this virus can, can avoid the induction of apoptosis. So just to conclude this part of the talk, well, I think I've shown you that there's an outward current, potassium current in HOH7 cells that's mediated by KV2.1, and it's blocked by replicons, it's blocked by JFH1, and that block is dependent on this P2 motif in NS5A. And NS5A blocks the oxidant-induced P38 activation and apoptosis. MLK3 is a key intermediate in this, in this effect, and what we're wondering is whether this might explain the absolute conservation of that P2 motif. So maybe the virus needs that P2 motif because it needs to avoid the induction of apoptosis in the infected liver. Now, of course, if you think about what's happening in, in cell culture, we're, we're using a, a very well-established cell line, HUH7 cells. So these are derived from a human hepatoma. They're actually very resistant to oxidative stress. And it could be that they're resistant enough not to show a phenotype of that prony mutant. So if you put that prony mutant, in, and it was done way, way back, was to put it into chimpanzees, it doesn't cause disease. So we think that what's happening in the, in the infected liver is that the normal hepatocytes will be more sensitive to the induction of oxidative stress. So you might see a phenotype of the prony mutant there because the virus is not able to, to block that oxidative stress. And indeed, if we take primary hepatocytes and treat with DTDP, those cells are dead in about 10 minutes, whereas HUH7 cells are much more resistant. They can, they can last a lot longer. So I think HUH7 cells are a great tool for, for studying this virus, but they are not 
they're not normal cells. They are very highly transformed. So we have to treat anything with a pinch of salt that we see in H0870 cells. So having said that, I think we, we have identified, oh, sorry about that, have identified a function for this, this P2 motif. OK. So I want to switch gears now for the last half of the talk and talk about a, a, a different aspect of NS5A, and that's the, the observation that NS5A is a highly phosphorylated protein. Now, you might have noticed in the schematics I showed you of NS5A so far that there's these two big Ps here, and these Ps represent sites of phosphorylation. And we know that this is a highly phosphorylated protein, and if you run it out on a gel and you run it carefully on a gel, what you'll see are two forms, and these are called hyperphosphorylated and basally phosphorylated forms. Both of these are phosphorylated because if you treat with phosphatase, you reduce these down to a smaller molecular weight band. JFH1 has a slightly bigger NS5A than some of the gene type 1 isolates. It has an insertion within domain 3. And so it runs slower on, on, on gels. But what you can see are still, there are still two bands, hyper and basically phosphorylated. And interestingly, this, is, this shows you what we see when we, when we stably transduce cells with a replicon and then pass them multiple times. And we start to lose that hyperphosphorylated form. So it seems to be there's some changes going on. We don't think it's the changes in the replicon, more changes in, in the cell. So we want to ask a few questions about this. So first of all, what sites are phosphorylated? We know it's phosphoprotein, but what sites get phosphorylated? And, and how many are them? Are there? Where are they? What are the kinases that are involved in that pho those phosphorylation events? And what ultimately is a function of that phosphorylation? And does that phosphorylation mediate some of the functions of NS5A? Could it be switching between the different functions? Perhaps those different dimer forms we'll come back to. So the way we went about this, and this was done by a, a graduate student in my lab, Doug, Doug Ross Threepland, and he, he purified NS5A from replicon cells. So he took, in the heroic efforts, he took cells which were expressing NS5A with a one strep tag, so strep tag NS5A, and he purified from 5 by 10 to the 9 replicon cells, which I think was about 100, 200 one, T175s. He purified NS5A using streptactin B dilution and went through mass spectrometry to identify sites of phosphorylation in this protein. So what did Doug find? Well, first of all, he found two novel phosphorylation sites that hadn't been identified before. One of these is threonine 346, which turns out to be right in the middle of that polyproline motif, in fact, in, in, in the low complexity sequence here. I'm not going to talk about that anymore because it doesn't have a phenotype. We can see no phenotype of that at all. He then identified a phosphorylation site in the middle of domain one. This is serine 146, and we'll come back to that in a minute. But the main observation was that in this low complexity sequence one here between domain one and two, which is highly serine rich, he saw lots of phosphorylation. So this is the sequence of a triptych peptide which, which exactly corresponds to the low complexity sequence one. The sequence here contains eight different serines. And what Doug found evidence for was within this peptide sequence that he found species which were either singly phosphorylated or all the way up to including seven phosphorylations. So monotoheptor phosphorylated species were present within here. So NS5A purified from cells was a mixture of different phosphor forms, some of which had a single phosphorylation, some had multiple phosphorylations. He could unambiguously define a species which had a single phosphorylation of serine 222. This is the amino acid sequence of NS5A starting from one. And also a, a diphosphorylated form which had 222 and 225 phosphorylated. But for the others, he couldn't unambiguously identify them. So for example, he identified a species that had seven phosphorylations by, by mass spec, but he couldn't tell you which of those seven residues was phosphorylated and which one wasn't, because we, didn't, we, couldn't, we couldn't extrapolate the data in, in, in sufficient detail. However, we know that this is highly phosphorylated, this region. So Doug set out to ask the question, well, what's, it, what's the importance of those phosphor? Now we've identified those sites of phosphorylation. Can we, can we determine what those phosphorylations are doing? So the first thing to do was to make some mutations. So when you have sites of phosphorylation, you can generate two types of mutations. You can mutate the serine to an alanine, which gives you a phosphoablatant mutation, serine or threonine, of course. This is no longer able to be phosphorylated. Or you can mimic phosphorylation by introducing an aspartic acid or glutamic acid. So that mimics the charge of phosphorylation, makes something, if you like, constitutively phosphorylated. 
So he introduced both serine to alanine and serine to aspartic acid mutations, phosphoablatant and phosphomimetic. And this is what he saw in, in terms of replicon replication. So what I'm showing you here is the luciferase activity of those subgenomic replicons at 72 hours post-transfection, normalized to the four-hour time point. And remember, I told you the four-hour time point, you can measure input translation because these RNAs are translationally competent. So what you see, for example, here for the wild type is that it's approximately 70 or 80-fold increased over 72 hours. That says that there's a massive replication of that RNA because there's more to be translated into luciferase. If you've got the GND mutant, it doesn't replicate. Therefore, you get a loss of signal. So what you can see is that for the majority of these mutations, actually, there's very little effect, with, with one or two exceptions. So the exceptions are to do with serine 225. So this was the second serine in that, in that uh, sequence, where if you mutate serine 225 to alanine, you see about a tenfold reduction in replication. And if you make a double mutation of 222 and 225, and remember, we found a peptide that corresponded to that doubly phosphorylated form, that produced a much more dramatic inhibition. If you mutate those to, to aspartic acid, there's no effect. So clearly, phosphorylation at that site is, is important for the process of, of replication. Well, what was perhaps more interesting is when Doug started to look by, by Western blot at these, at these um, phosphorylation events. So here, I'm, what I'm showing you is a Western blot for NS5A in replicon cells that were transfected with these various different replicons. And what I hope you can see I want to focus your attention on is this result for serine 146. So in serine 146, if you mutate that to alanine, you really have very little effect on hyperphosphorylation. And he's quantitated these blots to show that the percentage of, of NS5A that's hyperphosphorylated is about sort of 45, 50%, about the same as the wild type here. However, if you mutate that to aspartic acid, if you put the phosphomimetic mutant in there, you see a dramatic reduction in hyperphosphorylation. So that says that serine 146 may be regulating hyperphosphorylation in some form. Now, we don't think that's, that serine 146 is itself a site of phosphorylation within that hyperphosphorylated form. But uh, I'll show you data that, 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 that hopefully will convince you of that in a minute. So sure. I was thinking of the phosphorylated one, the upper half. Yeah, so both. Both forms are phosphorylated, but the, the upper form is hyperphosphorylated. Right. Yeah. When, you, when you introduce the mutation channel of 46C, mm -hmm. you expect to increase the upper band, wouldn't you? You would, yes, but you don't. You actually lose the upper band. So what, what's that? Phosphorylation of other sites. You, you lose phosphorylation of other sites, yeah. So what, what we think is happening is that this site is not, when this site is phosphorylated, it's not actually part of the upper band but it's, it's regulating the production of that hyperphosphorylation. So we think, that, as I'll show you in a minute, the phosphorylation, hyperphosphorylation is occurring within this LCS1. Okay, so serine 146 regulates hyperphosphorylation, and I'm not gonna show you, go take you through all this data, but just to highlight that when we make phosphomimetic mutants in a whole range of different residues within that region in the middle, in the LCS1, in each case, when we combine those with the serine 146D, we lose hyperphosphorylation. You can see these losses here, which are where we're mutating that serine 146 to, to, to a D146. So serine 146, when it's, when it's phosphorylated, is negatively regulating hyperphosphorylation. And we'll come back to that a bit later. And this was a novel, novel finding. Okay, so what, what we then then what Doug then did was to have a look in a bit more detail at phosphomimetic mutants in this LCS1. And I'll show you the LCS1 sequence again with all those serines. And what he did was to generate phosphomimetic mutants at a range of these. 229 we can't do because it's, absolutely, it's lethal, either as an aspartic acid or as an alanine. So that's clearly important for some other aspect of replication. But he made mutations at all of these other residues and then looked for the expression of NS5A and... Uh, and look by Western blot. And what I think you can see is that if we introduce the phosphomimetic mutant here at 236, what's happening is that the molecular weight of the hyperphosphorylated band is not changing, but the basic phosphorylated band is moving up. So it's moving more towards the hyperphosphorylated form. And in fact, there's a very nice trend if you look across here. So if we introduce a phosphomimetic mutant here at 222, we're not really having any effect 
on the molecular weight of either of those bands. But as we move that phosphometic across here, we're seeing a gradual change in the molecular weight of that basely phosphorylated band. And it's becoming more like the hyperphosphorylated band. So we were puzzling over this for a while. But what I think this gi gives us is some evidence for what is referred to as hierarchical or sequential phosphorylation across this LCS1. And I'll just show you in the next slide what I mean by hierarchical phosphorylation. So the, the dogma of hierarchical phosphorylation says that if you have a range of phosphorylation sites, kinase A can phosphorylate the first of these residues. So you can imagine kinase A could phosphorylate the serine at 238. And that phosphorylation induces a negative charge produces a phosphate, that then provides the recognition motif for another kinase that can come along, and we call this kinase B here, of course it could be the same kinase, allows that phosphorylation at the next residue down. And of course then you can imagine a cascade moving down this protein whereby each sequential phosphorylation allows additional phosphorylation at the next, the next residue going all the way down this protein. And actually, there's plenty of evidence in the literature for cellular proteins where this is the case. Classic example is the tumor suppressor P10, but there are plenty of other examples. And of course, this doesn't have to be a linear trajectory. It could be that kinase A phosphorylates here and allows phosphorylation down here, and that moves back there. That becomes more complicated to understand. But we think there's maybe a, a linear process that might be occurring within NS5A. So you could imagine that if we introduce the D, D mutation here, we're introducing a negative charge here, serine 238D. That would then drive that hierarchical phosphorylation all the way across LCS1. Whereas if we introduce that mutation at 225, it's only going to drive the hierarchical phosphorylation across here. So that there'll be less phosphorylation driven within, the, within these mutations. And so what we think is happening is that in 238D, because we're driving this hierarchical phosphorylation all the way across this, this region, we are converting that basically phosphorylated form more towards the hyperphosphorylated form. Because we're introducing lots of phosphates, it's moving that molecular weight close to the hyperphosphorylated form. We think there's still a difference between them, something else must be happening. But it says to us that phosphorylation of these residues here is important to generate that hyperphosphorylated form. Whereas if you introduce, that, say, 225D, you're only going to then drive the phosphorylation at 222. So you're only going to move that very slightly in terms of its molecular weight. So there's a, a gradation here occurring across this, across this protein. So if we think about that hypothesis, what that will then tell us is that serine, phosph serine 222 phosphorylation would probably be a hallmark of the hyperphosphorylated form. Because if you get phosphorylation all the way down here to 222, you're driving that up towards the hyperphosphorylated form. So do we have any evidence for that? Well, we have some evidence. So what we did was to generate a phospho-specific antibody to serine 22T. And then we looked to see by Western blot whether serine 22 was phosphorylated in either the hypo or basally phosphorylated form. And if you concentrate on this side of, the, of this image first, in wild-type replicon cells or in virus-infected cells, what you can see with this phosphorylation-specific antibody is it's only really detecting the hyperform. There's a very, very low detection of the basal form. We think that might be some background, non-specific detection of, of, this, uh, of the, of the anti-serum. If you make the mutation of serine 222 to A or to D, you lose that reactivity. So it's not detecting the phosphorylated form because it has a charge. It's detecting the, phosphor the phosphate as a part of that serine. So serine 222 appears to be a hallmark of the hyperphosphorylated form. If you take the same samples in Western blot with a pan NS5A antibody, you detect both of those. And you can see they're all present in equal amounts. So it really is that, that it's detecting that serine phosphorylated form. So serine 222 is only present in the hyperphosphorylated form. And the other bit of, bit of information that sort of kind of shows, shows that is to look at this, that distribution of those, uh, hyper, those um, phosphomimetics that I showed you in the last slide. And what you would predict that if, you, if serine 222 was part of that hyperphosphorylated form, if you were driving that hyperphosphorylation through that phosphorylation cascade, that the basally phosphorylated form would become serine 222 positive. And I think you can see some evidence for that there. It's not absolutely clear cut. So here's the wild type. We've got a bit of reactivity for serine 222 here. 
But when we, phosphorylate, when we mutate 225 to D, that will drive phosphorylation of 222. We're seeing a much higher phosphorylation with this PS222 antibody here. And likewise for that basically phosphorylated form. So we think that serine 222 is a, is a hallmark of the hyperphosphorylated form as its phosphorylation is driven by this phosphorylation cascade. What we don't know is what kinases phosphorylate that cascade yet. We're, we're working on that. So what's our conclusions then for NS5A and phosphorylation? Well, I think what I've shown you is that serine 146, when it's phosphorylated, can suppress hyperphosphorylation. But we think what we have is evidence for sequential phosphorylation across this, this low complexity sequence, which, which links domain one and domain two. We also have evidence of phosphorylation down here, which doesn't seem to have a phenotype. So what I think I've shown you is that hyperphosphorylated NS5A contains phosphoserine 222 plus lots of other phosphorylation sites. And I don't think that sequential phosphorylation across here is sufficient to completely recapitulate hyperphosphorylation. I think the basal form has to have something else happening to it. So maybe there's another phosphorylation somewhere else. We weren't able to really look at domain three because there are no triptych cleavage sites within domain three, so it didn't apply in the mass spec. So it could be there are more sites there. Indeed, we know there are some phosphorylation sites within domain three. We think that phosphorylation of serine 225 may be important for the protein to interact with PI4K, which in itself is important for virus RNA replication, establishing those replication complexes without, throughout the cell. And we think that the effect of serine 146 and that transcomplementation that I've shown you for serine 225 is suggestive of dimer formation. So we think that 5A is forming dimers within the cell and that those, those dimers can complement each other if you had a wild type and a mutant dimer coming together. And what I think is the big question now is really does, does phosphorylation drive that conformation or change in 5A? Does it allow it to switch between those different dimeric forms? Does it allow it to switch between forms that might be involved in RNA replication versus virus assembly? We don't know the full answer to that yet. But just to illustrate our thinking along that, those lines. So this is the... The, the two dimer forms that I've shown you before, what we call the closed conformation, where the two dimers are like this, and then what's called the open conformation, where the two dimers are switched, the two monomers, sorry, are switched and opened out like this. And these were the, the two crystal structures that were solved of NS5A. And actually, very interestingly, if you look in the dimer interface, serine 146 would actually map very closely to the dimer interface. If you look in the dimer interface, and then the crystal structure that was solved was a genotype 1, so it didn't have serine 146. It actually has an alanine there, which, again, may be important for JFH in terms of its replication. But there is, there's some electrostatic interactions between an arginine on one of the, of the monomers and, and uh, an E on the, on the other, and glutamic acid on the other one. And you can imagine that if you introduce a phosphorylation here, that might promote that dimer formation by introducing additional electrostatic charges, or it might disrupt the dimer formation, so it might drive it either one way or the other. And obviously, we don't know which direction it's moving at the moment, but it would be very interesting to, to try and determine that, perhaps by some, some crystallization studies to see which one we could favor by introducing, say, a phosphomimetic mutant here. OK, so I'll just finish there and thank you for your attention and introduce the people in the lab who did, did the work. And these are all most of these taken in back in November, which we call Movember in, in the UK, because everyone has to grow a moustache, even the ladies. Most of these were drawn on. So here's Doug, who really did grow a moustache, very impressive moustache, I have to say, and some of the others. So Doug did most of the work on the phosphorylation. Zofi's involved in the 5A interactions with MLK3, and these are some of the other people in the lab. We're very grateful to our alumni, some of whom will be familiar to some of you. Andrew McDonald and our works on, on human papillomavirus will be well known to, to Lawrence people who we've been interacting with for the electrophysiology and provided reagents, and particularly to the Wellcome Trust who for provided most of the funding for all of this work. So I'll stop there and take any questions. Thank you.